Welcome to Slash Forward. In this episode, we're going to take a look at the 2020 psychological thriller Vivarium. If you ever find yourself digging an endless pit of existential despair, consider subscribing to the channel. Let's get to it. We open on a nest where a cuckoo has laid its egg. Upon hatching, it manages to come out on top, forcing the mama bird to waste her best spring feeding and caring for it. This is referred to as foreshadowing, and it happens right outside the classroom where Gemma teaches, providing a prime opportunity to educate one of her youths about the cruel, unforgiving reality of nature. That's nature. That's just the way things are. You're terrible. It just so happens that this one tree is the one tree that her husband Tom happens to be in, and some tomfoolery ensues. Ah, uh -uh, come on. This Mr. Tree wants to get to know you. He buries the chickling in the most shallow of graves before they head off to the office of a nearby real estate developer where they meet Martin, the most natural and normal human person you're likely to ever meet. He quickly lures them in with his charms. Good. We're all happy then and leads them to their new development. They arrive at a meticulous suburban neighborhood filled with identical lots that seem to go on forever. And while this doesn't fit their bohemian lifestyle, they do humor Martin with a tour of the premise. Right when they find themselves looking for a way out, they run into some luck as Martin has managed to creepily slink away without them for reasons unknown. As they try to take advantage of this opportunity, they find that they're disoriented by the uniformity of the houses. And try as they might, they always end up back at Unit 9. This goes on until they run out of gas, with no reception and quickly draining phone batteries, they have few options left, so they bunk down for the night. The next morning, Tom attempts to get a better vantage point, but can't see the end of it. They use the sun as a directional guide and cut a straight path through the hood. They do this until the sun goes down, never getting to the edge of the development, but finally finding some differentiation as they arrive at a house with lights on. It ends up being Unit 9, but this time they have a blue apron delivery out front. However, instead of enjoying delicious pre-measured meals at an affordable price, Tom uses the full house to send up a significant smoke signal. They wake up the next morning covered in ash with a delivery made right in their faces. And this time it's not food? And they learn a simple rule about their confinement. As the situation unfolds, we see they're raising a little Martin, and we learn it hasn't been terribly long, although certainly maddening, especially at mealtime. Tom attempts to await their waste retrieval so he can brain whoever shows up with his pickaxe. And while doing so, he makes an odd discovery. In the fervor of engaging in this new project, he misses the box pickup, but is undeterred in his new goal. So Gemma leaves Tom to his landscaping efforts. They continue in their usual ways, sitting, digging, consuming relatable content. They even have temporary reprieve from their beige existence when they realize the car still has juice, resulting in an impromptu hop dance in classic summer concert festival style. But as with everything else, it's ruined by the boy. The next morning, they chew their tasteless cud and continue to grow distant. This eventually leads to Tom drawing distinct boundaries and choosing to take on his digging project alone. And as Tom descends into his pit of solitude, Gemma is left with nothing to occupy her time but the boy, who we now come to recognize as a master of cuckoldry. One day, Gemma discovers him missing. She searches the neighborhood, eventually finding him back at the hole, holding a book of unknown origin. It's filled with a strange lexicon and images that imply he's gotten nothing but Z chromosomes. He says he got it from a stranger, but he's not allowed to say who. And turning his penchant for mimicry into a game, she gets him to impersonate her and Tom and Dog, leaving only the newcomer in his repertoire. <laughs> But she regrets asking as she immediately hits her limit for existential horror. Soon enough, the boy has lost his boyish charms, whatever they may have been. Tom's been working his body to death, and Gemma has a new game she plays where she tries to follow the boy to wherever he goes each day, but fails. Her enthusiasm wanes as Tom finally makes progress, uncovering a shrink-wrapped body in his hole. In a strange shake-up to their routine, they find the one place they could always return to locked, with old boy in there watching what for him must be porn. The next day, they take some time for themselves. Some sunbathing, smoking, and reminiscing about the wind and the first time they met, things begin to get melodramatic. I kind of felt like I was home. But before it goes too far, Tom kicks off, mildly upsetting Gemma. When the boy returns, he offers up a dry cleaning bag for Tom and unceremoniously dumps him into the hole. And now, we gotta end this thing. So Gemma comes at him with a pickaxe and then follows him backstage to see how the sausage gets made. She traverses several houses where similar scenarios are ongoing before arriving back at her home, where she gasps for air on the ground like a baby bird. The boy then disposes of her body and prepares the house for its next occupants. Then he goes back to the office and becomes the new Martin. After after disposing of his desiccated and used up vessel, and he waits patiently for the next beta to cuck. 
Iberium was a movie with some big and broad ideas, but that suffered a bit in their implementation. Sometimes the character-driven portions seemed rushed in order to get all the pieces for this grand metaphor in place. If you enjoyed the video, I'd love for you to become a part of the channel by subscribing. Thanks for watching.